We're flying past the planets of our solar system. We pass by Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then we move through dark space beyond the edge of our world. We've reached our destination. It's the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical region around the solar system that holds tons of asteroids and blocks of ice. It's likely to be where the largest comet in human history was born. And now, it's heading toward the sun. Bernardinelli Bernstein was discovered totally by accident during the Dark Energy Survey. Our telescopes were pointed at distant space. Their main goal was to learn more about how the universe was expanding. Astronomers also wanted to make a more detailed map of the observable universe. Scientists analyzed over 80,000 images and found a moving object. It was alarmingly close to our home planet. Its size was an impressive 62 miles. That's about the width of Lake Michigan. It was an already active comet with a long tail. Usually, comets get a tail when they come close to the sun. The heat from the star warms the comet's surface, and light materials, like ice, begin to evaporate. This forms a cloud of steam and dust that stretches far beyond the comet. But Bernardinelli Bernstein is too far away from the sun to start heating up. This means that its surface has a different composition. It might be solid carbon monoxide. This increases the luminosity of the comet. That's why it can be observed with telescopes on Earth. We can compare Bernardinelli Bernstein to the largest meteorite to ever fall on Earth. About 66 million years ago, our planet was hit by a meteorite about six miles wide. At that time, the blast wave from the collision went around Earth several times. Tsunami waves caused by the impact were taller than the largest skyscrapers, and the energy from the explosion set huge areas on fire. Almost all living creatures, including dinosaurs and ancient fish, ceased to exist. The meteorite left a crater three times the size of Manhattan. The place where it fell was rich in sulfur. This substance evaporated because of the abnormal heat and gathered into massive clouds. This caused acid rains that were falling on Earth for several more weeks. Our newly discovered comet is 10 times bigger. If it were flying toward Earth, you'd see it with the unaided eye long before the impact. It looked like a moving star in the night sky. A few days before the comet reached our planet, you'd see it even during the day. You'd be able to distinguish its long tail, too. When the comet entered the atmosphere, it produced a booming sound so loud you'd hear it on the other side of Earth. At this point, the comet would begin to heat up because of friction with the air. It'd start burning. Countless pieces of debris would break away from the main body of the meteorite and fall to Earth. As soon as Bernardinelli Bernstein touched the surface of the planet, we'd see a flash so bright it outshine the sun. In a fraction of a second, a colossal amount of energy would be converted into heat. This would create the most powerful explosion in the history of our planet. It'd literally rip out chunks of ground and throw them into the air. The blast wave would incinerate everything within a few hundred miles. It continued to spread in different directions, breaking and bending trees. At one point, it reached snow-capped mountains and triggered huge avalanches that would cover many villages. The blast wave would go around the planet, shattering glass and buildings on all continents. Tsunami waves would be so high they would cover entire coastal cities. The most powerful earthquake in history would break the ground and create deep cracks. After the impact, billions of tons of dust and ash would rise into the air. A giant black cloud would completely block the sun's rays. Earth would be plunged into darkness. All the debris in the air would start melting. They'd turn into liquid lava and fall back to the surface, causing even more damage. The ash and dust in the air would cover the sun for several more months. During this time, the temperature on Earth would drop by several degrees. Even if they were hiding in deep shelters and bunkers, people, as well as all other living organisms on the planet, would be unlikely to survive this event. Fortunately, Bernardinelli Bernstein isn't going to approach Earth. Right now, the comet is about 20 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 20 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. It means the comet will soon cross the orbit of Uranus. In 2031, it'll be 11 astronomical units away from our star. That's just outside Saturn's orbit. This is going to be the closest Bernardinelli Bernstein will approach the Sun. 
then it will begin its flight back to the edge of the solar system. But the comet is bound to return again. It'll move away from the sun and slow down until the star's gravity pulls it back. Then the comet will make another circle around our solar system, but that will take about 3 million years. Right now, we have other meteorites to worry about. For example, 3200 Phaedon. It crosses the orbits of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Then it goes around the Sun and comes back. This cycle takes about 523 days. Then it starts over again. This meteorite is considered potentially hazardous because it crosses Earth's orbit at 7.5 Earth-Moon distances. During one of its last approaches to Earth, this 3.6-mile-wide block of rock showered our planet with small meteors. Since the asteroid often passes by the Sun, its surface is most likely to look like the dry bottom of a mud swamp. It's covered in scales and cracks. As it flies past Earth, these scales break off and cause meteor showers. But the largest, potentially hazardous asteroid is the 1999 JM8. It's about the size of 77 soccer fields. It passes by Earth at nine lunar distances. Its closest approach to our planet will happen in August 2137. If such a meteorite were to hit Earth, an entire continent could be wiped out. The rest of the world would experience massive tsunamis, but would survive the event. So naturally, scientists are thinking of ways to protect the planet from such a disaster. The first solution is a controlled Big Bang. One of the laws of physics says that if you apply some force in one direction, it'll cause a reaction in the opposite direction. So if we spot an asteroid that is about to collide with Earth, we'll need to send a rocket toward it. This way, we'll produce a controlled explosion, not inside, but right above its surface. The blast will be directed upward, and the asteroid will shift downward. Even this tiny shift would be enough to change the trajectory of the asteroid, and then it'll fly past Earth. Another way is to send a heavy object, like a spaceship, toward the space body. Every heavy object has its own gravity, so the spacecraft will have to fly close to the asteroid, which will attract the ship to its surface, but the engines of the spacecraft will resist. The ship will start pulling the asteroid in the opposite direction. This will change the trajectory of the asteroid, and our planet will remain intact. We can also ram the asteroid with the spaceship. Bam! Or, we could build a space station, like the ISS. It would be equipped with a bunch of huge magnifying lenses. We would send the station closer to the sun and start looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Then, we'd point all the lenses so that the sun's rays would focus on the giant rock. The heat would begin to vaporize the matter from the asteroid's surface. That's where physics would come into play again. The matter would evaporate upward, and the asteroid would move downward. We could also wrap the asteroid in a reflective film, something like foil. Usually, space bodies absorb most of the sun's rays, but if the asteroid was covered in foil, the rays would bounce off its surface. This would create a weak pushing force. That should be enough to avoid the collision. Of course, we could attach rocket engines to the asteroid. This way, we would be able to not only change its trajectory, but also control it but that would depend on the size of the asteroid and the number of engines. And then, we could use this massive rock to ram it into other, larger asteroids. It was September 2nd, 1859. People all over Europe and North America woke up at night, confused and still tired. They were sure it was already morning. It was so bright outside. But when they looked out of their windows, they discovered it wasn't sunlight. The skies were lit by countless intense auroras, red, green, and purple. They were so brilliant, one could read a book as easily as in the afternoon. Auroras appeared even in the regions where they had never been witnessed before, like Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Hawaii. Cool visual effects weren't the only thing that both mesmerized and horrified people. The most high-tech stuff at that time, telegraph wires, shorted out throughout Europe and the US. Sparks were flying from equipment, and many human operators got electric shocks. Papers and telegraph offices burst into flames. 
all the machines were immediately disconnected from their batteries, and still, they mysteriously kept sending broken messages. Fires, ignited by short circuits, spread over large areas. Colorful lights kept dancing overhead. All this caused panic and total confusion. Earth's inhabitants had never seen or experienced anything like that before. At that time, very few people knew that the sun was to blame for the chaos. One of them was English astronomer Richard Carrington. At about 11 a.m. on September 1st, the man was standing by a telescope in his private observatory. He was watching sunspots on the surface of the sun. Suddenly, two patches of intense white light broke out. They looked as bright as direct sunlight. At that moment, the astronomer didn't know what a terrible commotion these flares would cause. Later, it became clear that the sun had produced an epic geomagnetic storm and unleashed it at our planet's protective layer. Wave after wave of charged particles slammed into Earth's atmosphere. The planet's magnetic field wasn't powerful enough to stop them. It gave way, and the storm hit Earth, causing havoc. The phenomenon got the name of the Carrington event. So far, it's been the worst solar storm ever recorded. Good thing it happened when people didn't have advanced technologies and weren't that vulnerable to the sun's geomagnetic fury. The 1859 solar storm was three times more powerful than the one that happened on March 13, 1989. Three days before it began, astronomers watched a massive eruption on the sun's surface. Within a couple of minutes, a billion-ton cloud of gas was hurled away from the star. It rushed straight toward our planet at a speed of millions of miles per hour. On Monday the 12th, the huge mass of solar plasma reached Earth's magnetic field. This storm was so fierce, it lit spectacular auroras and created underground electric currents beneath North America. These currents must have found some weaknesses in the power grid of Quebec, Canada. In less than three minutes, the entire city lost power. Millions of people found themselves in pitch black streets, dark buildings, and stuck elevators. They woke up in freezing cold homes, unable to cook breakfast. The following 12-hour blackout closed businesses, airports, and schools. The Montreal Metro was also shut. In the US, hundreds of power grids started to have problems minutes after the storm hit Earth's surface. Luckily, none of these issues led to a blackout. The storm was severe enough to disrupt satellite communication systems and radio signals. Some space satellites tumbled out of control for a few hours. Lots of them had mysterious problems that went away as soon as the storm began to subside. No newspaper mentioned it, but in 2012, Earth had a close shave after narrowly missing an extreme solar storm, the most intense in the past 150 years. On July 23rd, Astronomers at Space Weather Prediction Center in Colorado spotted two clouds of energetic particles. They erupted from the sun's surface and barreled into space. Just 19 hours later, these clouds zoomed past the spot our planet had just left. If the solar eruption had happened several days earlier, Earth would have ended up in the line of fire. So, what if a solar storm as powerful as the iconic Carrington event happened nowadays? How much more harm would it cause? Would our life get back on track after such a disaster? Before you learn the answers to these questions, let's figure out what a solar storm is. The sun is a gigantic, constantly changing ball of molten gases. Every once in a while, it spews out bursts of energy, solar flares. They often go hand in hand with something called coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can speed up to more than 600 miles per second. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison with solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with the temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. 
the star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. Scientists classify solar flares depending on how brightly they shine in X-rays. You aren't likely to notice the tiniest flares if you don't have special equipment. Medium solar flares lead to fleeting radio blackouts at the poles, but nothing too serious. It's X-class flares people should worry about. They cause the strongest and longest-lasting solar storms. When people think about danger coming from space, most of them imagine an approaching asteroid, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. But apparently, we should be much more worried about our good old sun. A super strong solar storm heading toward Earth won't happen at once. First, there will be high energy sunlight, mostly ultraviolet rays and X-rays. They will ionize our planet's upper atmosphere and mess up radio communication. After that, a radiation storm will hit Earth. And finally, several days later, a colossal cloud of charged solar particles will reach our atmosphere. The particles will interact with the planet's magnetic field and wreak havoc all over the world. If an intense solar storm happened these days, it would start by disrupting GPS and knocking out satellites. If any astronauts were spacewalking at that moment, they would have a mere minutes after the first flash of light to find shelter. Their spacecraft would likely be properly shielded and safe enough. The main challenge would be to get inside in time. After that, the storm will proceed to interfere with satellite communications. That's why tons of your daily activities, from calling your friends to paying with your credit card, would be at risk. But one of the worst consequences would be connected with power grids. Power surges caused by the particles coming from the sun would damage giant transformers. Those take ages to replace, especially if hundreds or even thousands get wrecked. In some places, a failure of one power grid would make others collapse as well, creating a domino-like reaction. Picture living without electricity for a day, a month, a year. No light, no computers, no phones, water supply systems out of order, no food in supermarkets. Plus, without electricity, it would be next to impossible to reboot the already failed power grids. A powerful solar storm would cost people one trillion to two trillion dollars, and that's just during the first year after it happens. It would take the world another four to ten years to recover. The damage to all kinds of satellites alone would reach seventy billion dollars. Under majestic auroras, people would have to get used to a new, dramatically different lifestyle. No doubt, we'd have some kind of warning. Modern equipment all over the world and in space doesn't stop watching the sun even for a second. Once a bad solar storm happens, people would have some time to prepare, between several hours and a couple of days. And if transformers are taken offline in time, the consequences won't be so dramatic. Now, the following news might sound scary. There are also super flares. In comparison to them, our sun's burst of radiation are small potatoes. Super flares mostly occur in young and active stars. In 2016, astronomers saw such a phenomenon. A star 1,500 light years away from Earth produced a flare that was 10 billion times more powerful than any of those that burst from our sun. It doesn't mean we're safe here on Earth. Even our middle-aged sun knows how to produce super flares. But while young stars can have them once a week or even more often, for the sun, it's once in a few thousand years. And still, if people don't figure out how to protect the planet, just one super flare can shred our ozone layer and wipe out life on Earth. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark glassy pebbles. 
a trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tectites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best-preserved craters on Earth. 
It was formed 50,000 years ago, when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds. But no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba Crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater.